and welcome to part two. Last time we found out why a Scotsman fell in love with Welsh football. This time the turn of a scouser, Lee Trundle. So Lee, first of all, we're going to start at the beginning of your career. You spent five years in non-league before joining Real, obviously, at the age of 24. At that stage in your career, were you quite content playing at that level? Did you, you, know, did you think that your chance to make it as a pro had kind of gone? No, I always knew that um, you know, I wanted to go and play, play professional football and you know, it wasn't as though I was just settling for, for non-league. But beforehand, Ab, it, was, you know, it was never about me ability. It was, it was my dedication to the game and how I applied myself. You know, I, wasn't, I wanted to be a professional footballer, but wasn't professional at all. You know, in them days, before real, I'd go out on a Friday night before a game not get into all hours, then go and play, and then I'd be back out on a Saturday. So even though I was saying I wanted to be a professional footballer, I was doing everything to stop myself from from being that. So it wasn't until I went to I went to Will, um my ex girlfriend at the time, she got pregnant, and then it was it you know it hit home for me that it's not just about me now. There's someone else here, and as soon as I found that out, I knuckled down, started training myself every single day. Um, got going on runs and things like that, and within four months of doing that, I signed for Wrexham. Wow! So, how much did that, you know, did that affect your mentality as well and your belief that you could make it? Did you start, you know, did you start seeing improvements on the pitch as well? Yeah, obviously fitness-wise and stuff like that. Don't get me wrong; I was still a, a young lad, so I was still doing, I was still scoring goals and I was still standing out, but not as much as. I was when I started applying myself properly. You know, I think you, I, I believe with your football ability, you've got that. That you know, that's just what you've got. It's the other side off the pitch, what you've got to work at, and that's what is the downfall of a lot of players. You know, luckily for me, it happened where I, I did go into professional football, but um, yeah, the difference in me from them, my fitness. You know, I was doing stuff at the end of games, which I'd be doing at the start, where probably beforehand. Fitness-wise, I'd die down a little bit towards the end of end the game. So I've seen a, a massive change and just a massive change in myself as well. Belief to go out and and um, and play well for the ninety minutes. You know, I think at real I'd scored seventeen in my first fifteen games. So you know, I, I could see the difference from the, the fitness side. And it's quite interesting. Andy Morrison said yesterday that. You know, f- throughout uh, the early days of his career, he would go out fishing in the morning. His dad would take him, and he always had that. If he played badly, he couldn't look at his father, or you know, it was always instilled in him. And do you think that's something that you can kind of relate to? In you know, if you don't have that application, then it's very difficult to to then be able to put that onto the pitch. Really, you kind of need that motivation and that that kind of feeling inside you that if you do badly you really need to give yourself a kick? I think we all have different motivations. I think what Andy's saying, you know, it, we all work different ways and we all need certain things to make us work. And, you know, for Andy, that worked for him. For me, I, I never, ever thought, um, thought that way. You know, I went out on the pitch to enjoy myself and, and to play with a smile on my face. So I would, I would never, ever go out to think in my head I was going to, disappoint anyone or you know that wasn't my driving force my driving force was go out there play with a smile on your face and and enjoy the game because I love being out on that pitch and that's what if I never enjoyed the game that's when I'd probably be a bit hard on myself but I'd never had any outside influences where I would think I was letting anyone down or use that as my driving force mine was always just go out and, and enjoy my football and just to bring it back to Rill, just for a second, how sad is it to see, you know, what's gone on there over the last few months, especially with the winding up of the club and they've had to, had to re-establish themselves, really? It, it's very sad because, you know, they're one of the, the, the best sides in the, the Welsh League. If you look back over the, the years and the history, you know, they're one of the, the big clubs in it. Same happened with Clenethley as well, where they was brilliant in the Welsh League and they had to reform and start again. So I think you Real can take anything from it. You know, if you look at Glen Eckley, they built themselves back up. I know they only spent one year in the, in the Welsh Prem since doing that. But at least he showed that, you know, there is a way back. And I, I hope Real does be, because I've got very fond memories of the football club. You know, that was a, a place where I went and 
it gave me my start in professional football. So, you know, I've got a, a lot of thanks to the football club. And how big a change was that going from non-league to the Welsh Premier League? You know, how different was it in terms of fitness, in terms of, I know you've already mentioned that from a different perspective, but just in terms of, you know, the professionalism of the club and things like that? Yeah, I think if I'm honest, at the, at the start, you know, I... I was playing in the conference at the time for, for Southport. So coming to the, the Welsh League, I didn't, for myself personally, I, I seen it as, you know, was I lessening my chance of becoming a professional footballer? Because I thought if you're doing it at, at Southport at that level, you're going to have more of a chance to go in and with the English, with the English setup as well. And I do think that's still the same with the Welsh League. I think the Welsh League is overlooked. I think it's overlooked for the players that are in it. I think it's overlooked for the managers that are in it. And that's just the sort of stigma that it has, where if you go and play in it and see what, you know, see the league itself, you realise that the standard is is very good. So I was probably a bit naive to that thinking I was taking a big step down. Um, but my agents at the time said, listen, come on, let's go, give it a go. I think it'll be good for you at the time. You know, with um, your had goal, it was called at the time, where they showed the goals on the, on the TV and you had your highlights. So, you know, I went along and, Fair play to me agents. It was a it was a great move for me because I I enjoyed every minute of playing there. And of course, from Rill, you went to Wrexham, and then Brian Flynn took you from Wrexham to Swansea as well. How big an impact did Flynn have, and how grateful are you to him for what he's done for your career? Oh, massive! You know, Brian Flynn is you know a, a massive part of of my career. Not only was he the one who signed me for Wrexham, and you know, if you think about it, you're going from the League of Wales to League One at the time, which is a pretty big jump, you know, to take a chance on, on someone. And it wasn't as though you were just getting them on a free. He had to pay money for us as well to Rill. So, you know, it was a, it was probably a gamble on his side because you, you never know, all right, you can score goals in, in the Welsh League. And I did play against Wrexham's first team and scored a hat-trick in a friendly before I went. So that probably, you know, give him a bit more confidence that I could perform at that level. But still, you just never know. So, you know, for him is a massive part of my career, not only signing me for Wrexham, but if he wasn't the manager of Swansea, I never ever would have come to Swansea because, you know, it was four hours away from, from Liverpool where I live. I'd just been promoted with Wrexham to the league above. So if Flinney wasn't at Swansea, I never would have come. But, you know, I'm so glad he was because it was the, the best move of my life in football. And at that time, you know, then did you feel a pressure on yourself to, to perform? And kind of, you know, for Flinney, if anyone, he's taken that massive gamble. Did you feel that pressure to kind of, you know, give it back to him? Yeah, it's, it's a funny one, because I, people talk about pressure in different ways. And I've never, I've never seen football like that. I just don't, I don't look at it like that. I look at it as, as enjoyment. I believe in, in my ability and what I can do out on the pitch and, and when I go out, I play with that sort of, like I'm a kid playing in the playground or like I'm playing on the field with my mates, I'll try different things. I'll, you know, I'll do stuff which other players might not try. I'm not saying that they can't do it, but they just might not try it for confidence-wise. Um, so I've never, ever seen pressure like that in football. I've just enjoyed every single part of it. You know, the bigger the occasion, the bigger the crowd, you know, the more I've, I've wanted to play in it. And I think that's a massive part of why I still play now because. I think if pressures of football can get to you, not only on the pitch, but in your in your everyday life as well, you know, it can bring a lot of pressure where I think I've been lucky enough to just love the game and love playing with a smile on my face that I just want to keep going for as long as I can. And it's that freedom as well, isn't it, to express yourself. I think people might say you're quite flamboyant off the pitch. Um, you know, it's quite it's just that ability to to express yourself on it as well. Definitely, yeah. And I think that's having the right managers as well to, to give you that freedom. And, you know, Flynn, he was certainly that manager for me. You know, he never put any stipulations on me or told me any jobs that I needed to do. He just said to me, go out and just play, get on the ball around that box and, and do what you can do. And, you know, he'd never say to me, come back for corners or I want you to mark him. I want you to sit around this midfielder. It was just go out and you do what you do and we'll set up as a team to to do the rest so you know for me to have a manager like that and give me that freedom you know it, that was music to my ears and how quickly after you signed for Swansea did you realize how unique a club it was I think straight away I think even before I come down I played for Wrexham in the Welsh Cup final at, at the Vetch and um, we 
we won two one Wrexham on the day, but I, you know, I seen the fans and how hostile it was to to play there as a an opposition player. So for them to come down there, and I started off pre season uh, really well and went to Holland where I scored some uh, good individual goals, and that's when someone nicknamed me Magic Daps, and I had to ask one of the I had to ask Chris O'Leary what does Daps what does Daps mean, and he told me what it was. So. You know, I think if you move to a football club and the fans take to you straight away, it helps you settle in. Because at the time, I only signed a year contract because it was my first time living away from home. I didn't know how I, how I was going to be, so I signed a year contract. And within the first two months um, of me being there, I signed a, a two-year extension to stay there because I knew it was a, the place where I wanted to be. And your character just matches up perfectly, doesn't it, with Swansea and everything that's associated with it? Well, I think if you look at the club at the time, you know, we just managed to stay in the league the year before, you know, and being at the bottom in relegation dogfights. And then for for me to, to come after that and to bring players like where we had Leon Britton, Roberto Martinez, Tati, Andy Robinson, you know, bringing these players in, who was then going to, all of a sudden, you're not, you're not a team fighting down the bottom now. You're a team that's going to be fighting at the top. And I think we just all come together at the right time. I think because I was the, the goal scorer and, you know, I was doing tricks and doing different things. I think that I saw to, the fans sort of see me as leading it. But if you look at the other players who come to the football club as well, it was, it was great signings by Brian Flynn and we all pushed the club on together. But, you know, if you look at a football fan, every football fan loves a, a player that scores goals and, you know, if you're there scoring goals and, as I say, the tricks on top of it, you know, the fans took to me straight away. And then that sort of gave me the confidence and the power to go out and, and keep trying things and keep doing what I was doing. Because there's times when I would lose the ball. You know, I'd, I'll still do it now, but try things. I'll lose the ball at times. But I know them from the crowd was never, ever going to get on my back. If I tried to do something and never come off, they'd still clap. So for me, that just gives me a license to just go out and keep doing it. And, you know, in the end, luckily for me, you know, the goals come. And I think as well, it kind of puts Swansea on the map in terms of, you know, you're on Soccer AM pretty much every week. And, you know, how did you, how did you enjoy and embrace that side of things? Yeah, I loved it. You know, um, I think growing up, I always wanted to watch me goals on the television with music behind. That was something that I always, I always wanted to, wanted to do, you know, so to see me goals on the TV. Because don't forget, I'll come into professional football at 24. So, you know, I've been a, a massive football fan all my life, watching these players on the TV scoring goals and being on shows. So for now, for me to be on them were, was excellent. And not only to be on them, but in a positive way for myself and for the football club as well. And I think as a, as a Swansea fan, I'm going to speak to them and, you know, I'm out and about everywhere. And I'm going to talk to them. You know, fans say that it's sort of made them proud to, you know, this is our football club and look what our players are doing. And, you know, that's a lovely feeling for me when fans would, would come up and say that to me. Definitely. And you mentioned, obviously, Roberto there. And he was obviously uh, praised for developing the style of play at Swansea as a manager. But I'm just interested to know how much of that was evident, even when he was a player, you know, is he trying to implement those things even as a player? Um, not as much as obviously when he was a manager, you know, he'd, he'd have a certain, his own style of play and the way he'd want to play. But if you look at Kenny Jacket to Roberto, it's night and day. Do you know what I mean? The way them two see football is completely different. And, it, you know, I'm not saying one's good and one's bad because they both get results. You know, Kenny got us out of um, Division 2, which is with League 2, which is, a you know, a hard league to get out of. So, you know, there's different ways of playing football. So, he Although Roberto would talk and chat to us, he probably wouldn't have had an input on that side because Kenny set his team up a, a completely different way. You know, there was times where Roberto never played. You never even had Leon Britton in the middle, which, you know, as any Swansea fan would think, how is Leon Britton not in a Swansea team? And it was just the way Kenny set up. He set up with Chris O'Leary and oh, and Tudor Jones in the middle, so big lads, because he thought that's what needed to get out of this division. But Roberto had a completely different mindset. And as you say, when he come... The football that Roberto brought and the philosophy and the style of play was was brilliant and he had the players to do that and you know I think everyone says Roberto is the one that started off the Swansea way and you know I would back that 100%. Definitely and and then you went so you were scoring 20 plus goals a season for four years running 
and you were in such a tight knit environment. How difficult was it to replicate that then when you went to Bristol? I don't think it was ever going to be replicated, if I'm honest. I think it was just a completely different style of play. You know, when I was at Swansea, we played, everything was geared around me where our wingers would play on opposite sides. We'd come inside and play balls into my feet and we'd work off that way. At Bristol, we played with two wingers, Michael McIndoe and Ivan Sproul, who were both lightning quick. Now, you know, I've never, you've watched over the years, I've never been the fastest player. I think if I have a race with 95% of players, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get beat on a foot race. But, you know, playing in, going to Bristol and playing in that way where they were getting the ball, going to the byline, getting crosses in. You know, I'd never, ever scored goals like that. And, you know, I just don't think it, the style suited me. I found myself playing out on the left a lot of times as well. And, you know, I think the time that I had at Swansea was so special and, you know, everything went right. It was hard to get that where any other club I went. But at the time, I was 31. You know, Bristol were paying a million pounds for me, which is... I still think is a you know a massive achievement and something that I'm proud of to look back on. And obviously the financial side of it, it was something at that age coming into the game at th- at 24. You know, it was I just couldn't I just couldn't um, turn that down. And of course, from there you went on to have loan spells at Leeds and then back at Swansea before returning to the Welsh Premier League with Neath. How difficult was it then to adapt back to playing in the Welsh Premier League? Was that quite a difficult transaction? No, I, t- I found it. I found it quite easy. I think. Um, I think the way I I play as well. You know, as I say, I, I go out and it's I play with freedom. So I, I think whatever level I'm at, I'll always I'll always still in, enjoy it. So it wasn't as though you know I'd played in them leagues since I was sixteen in the non league le- leagues right the way up to twenty four. So it's not as though I'd been at an academy and everything, and then I'm finishing professional football and going into that, and it's a culture shock. You know, it's. That's just another game of football for me. We had a good side, a good management team. And as I say, the lads in there were a great bunch of lads. And, you know, I really enjoyed my time with them. And how do you think, you know, you coming back into the league, I think, as you've mentioned before, you know, sometimes it's overlooked, the Welsh Premier League and Welsh leagues in, in general. It's quite, well, it's quite often seen as, you know, a lower standard to to other leagues, how much did you feel like you had a role to play and that you could influence maybe the way it was seen when you came back? Yeah, same again, Ab. I didn't really, I didn't think of it in, in that sort of way. I just seen it as, you know, playing, having a game of football. Because after, you know, if we talk about going into the, the Welsh League, which is still, when I finished at Preston and my professional career was over and I started my job at Swansea, I went back and played for my two teams in Liverpool, which one was my me, me local amateur team from where I grew up, and the other one was my Sunday pub team. So I dropped even more down the leagues then, you know, to play in the in the amateur leagues. But the same again, I always, my mate was the manager, and he said to me, when you finish, come and play for me. And I said, yeah, I will. So I went and played for him for two years. And then it wasn't until um, my partner got pregnant with, with Lily now. So then it meant that I couldn't go back and forth to Liverpool every other weekend and, and leave her and the baby on her own. So that's when I signed for, for Flynn Eckley then. And, you know, same again. It was, what, it was one where I've just went and I wanted to have a game of football still. So I played with Hillo at Neath. He, he, was, a, he was my strike partner there. And he was the manager of Flynn Eckley. So I went and joined there. And, you know, it was, it was brilliant to, to go and play football at a level again where it's starting to get noticed and your goals are back out there because, you know, it, it's still nice to, to see as you get older. I think you'd appreciate it a lot more, but I never, ever see myself as a focal point to think, oh, I'll go and raise profile for the league or I'll come in and I'll do this. I just honestly come in to just enjoy a game of football on a Saturday. And how would you say Welsh football has developed from obviously your time at Rill to then when you came back into the Welsh leagues? Had you noticed any developments? Yeah, massively. I think it's got um, a lot better. I just think in general, football's got better. The lower you go down, I think it's the, the more professional. I think the coaching badges that you need now in the Welsh leagues as well. These managers and coaches are going on the FAW courses and, you know, it's given them um, more of an insight about to run a professional team. You're getting professional players coming in, like Andy, who's been a pro and has now come into the game. So he's going to be bringing his professionalism into into that level and I think with the amount of teams 
that are going full time now in in the Welsh Premier League. Um, I think it shows that the the league is getting stronger, and even the cup where they go and play the Scottish teams, you know, they're competing against them. And I just think the league and the players are getting better. I think if you look back years ago, the standard of the pitches probably affected that. And I think if you go down the leagues now, if you go into the Championship now, Welsh Championship and the other divisions, you know, I think the standard of the pitches need to to look at instead of saying, oh, we need. 400 seats, you know, put the money into the pitch because most fan, most teams don't get 400 or how many 200 fans there. So, you know, if they could do that at the at the lower level and sort the pitches out. But if you look at the Welsh um, Prem, a lot of them now are 4G pitches. So the football and the stand of the football is getting a lot better. And it's, you know, I enjoy watching it myself as well, the Welsh League. And I know we touched upon it earlier, but do you think Welsh football should be utilised more by clubs in the English pyramids? Yeah, I think it should. And I think it it, it will be, in, you know, because the teams are getting better and the, I think the standard of the football's getting getting better. You know, I look at the Welsh League and there's players there that could go and play at the professional level, 100%. You know, there's some really good players in there, really good young players. I don't know how they apply themselves off the pitch. Maybe that's a stumbling block for them because I know that's how I was myself. But you look at the ability of some of them and the way they set up and the game plan that they have, especially in the Welsh Premier League, you know, they could definitely go and fit into the professional um, pyramid and, and hold their own because, you know, I've been impressed with some of the players there. And of course, one player it worked for was Ben Cabango. How impressed have you been with him since he came back from TNS? Yeah, really good. And I think for the for the young lads, you know, that's one thing that I would say is to get out on loan and, and play proper men's football because, you know, you can play in 23s level, which is great. It's great for development, but it's it's a bit nice. It's nice football where you go into a dressing room where there's points on offer, where there's win bonuses at times, where, you know, other bonuses, if you're getting up to the league and you need points to win, you know, you, you see... You see real men's football then. And I'd say for any kid out there, they need to go and play proper football because it'll bring them on. And, you know, people look at Ben going into the Welsh Prem. You look at him now playing there and then going into Swansea first team. You know, I think it's it's been brilliant for him. And he's he's went into the first team at Swansea and, you know, he's fitted right in. I think he's a, a great prospect, not only for Swansea, but for the Welsh national team too. Definitely. And, you know, you've got him and Joe Roden at Swansea, who you obviously see quite a lot of. They could be the Welsh centre-back partnership for years to come, couldn't they? I think that they will be. And if I'm honest, I would I'd have them two as my two centre-halves at Swansea. You know, obviously there's been speculation about Joe, um, you know, because of what he's, what he's done. And I think if he does move on, you know, I think he, he deserves to because he is a... He is a talent that should be playing at the top level. I'm happy that we've got him at Swansea at the moment. But I think he's a similar one to Dan James where, you know, you're just more or less waiting for someone to come in because he is that good. But, you know, to have them two playing together, if we are lucky enough to have Joe come the start of next season or even now, I would put him and Ben in together and, and give them a go because, you know, there's probably players at the club who are not going to be there next year. Um, so for me, I him in and it's the perfect opportunity to, to put them together. Definitely. And how important is it that Swansea keep producing this international talent as well? Yeah, I think it's very important. I think especially the way the football club is now, we're not going to be a club that's going to go out and be spending transfer fees on players. I think that we've we've seen that. We know that's going to happen. So I think we've got to start producing our youngsters and bringing them through. And over the years, we've had some brilliant players come through, some talenters has come through and probably kept us kept us going, you know, especially with the with the sales of them as well as a football club. So I think we will keep producing, you know, the lads in the in the academy got some very good coaches in there and the players that they're producing to come up have, have been excellent players. So let's hope we can see more in the future. Definitely. And of course you're still playing at Ammonford at the moment. You're juggling that with your role at Swansea City. How fulfilling is that role for you? We see you off many different places with children, putting smiles on their faces. How fulfilling is that? Oh, it's it's brilliant, Ab. I think it's if you look at the you know, the two, it's it's a perfect mix for me, you know, through the week I'll be out and about in the schools or different charity events and, and with the kids and 
you know, I think even when I've been a player, I've always loved that side of it. If he was if there was a function going on and someone needed to go from the club, you know, I would always I would always go along because I think that it's a, an important role as a footballer. You know, you're representing your football club and you should get out there with the fans and and spend time with them. And I think even more so now, the way we, the lads will have to play in empty stadiums, they'll realise how much them fans mean to the football club because I don't know what, how I would have coped playing in these games where, it's, where there's no one watching. I don't know if I would have been able to get myself up for it because I would have found it really strange. You know, I was someone who fed off the crowd and that's what I needed. So it'll be interesting to, to see how it is. But, you know, to, to represent the football club on the pitch and now to be lucky enough to, to carry on doing it while I'm retired from professional football, you know, it's, it's a job for me that I love and, you know, I hope that I can stay in, stay in it and stay in Swansea for the rest of my life. Definitely. And as someone who is still playing in the Welsh system, how big a win do you think it is for Connors Key Nomads to have gone and won the Welsh Premier League this season? Yeah, I think it's massive. And I think it goes to show, you know, with TNS, I think TNS have been the best side in if, uh, you know, I don't, since I can remember, the style of football that they play is, is excellent. You know, they've got some really good players there. But I think the more teams that are to come full time now, the more challenging the league will be. Because if you've got TNS who were full time on their own for a lot and the rest were part time, the gap is too the gap is too big because TNS, it's their job where the others come in part time. It's probably just their hobby. And if they wouldn't take it as probably not probably, you know, they wouldn't think of it this way, but they wouldn't take it as serious as what TNS would because it's all TNS have thought about. And especially if you're full-time, you're going to be able to get the best players from around them areas as well. They'll want to come and sign for you rather than just go part-time. So I think it's, it's brilliant. You know, they've had, a, they've had a great season. And for them to, to win the league is a, is a massive achievement. And, you know, fair play to, to Andy. He's done a great job there. And let's hope he can carry it on. Definitely. And what's next for you next season? Are you going to stay at Ammonford, keep playing there? Yeah, I'm going to keep playing. I'll, I'll stay at Ammonford. I enjoyed my time there in this year. It's a, a football club that are trying to do things right. They want to move in the right direction. You know, they, they just had the stand fitted. They had floodlights last year. And it's a great feel. It's a nice family club. You know, everyone's everyone's in it together. And I've really enjoyed me football here. we got a, a young manager who is... Is really he's got some great knowledge, got some great ideas as well. I've enjoyed playing for him, so it's a it's a football club where you know I'll probably stay there now until to finish playing, if I'm honest. And you've got someone there as well, haven't you? Who you're quite used to providing you assists on the football pitch. Yeah, but not so many assists now. He takes too many shots at the moment. So I think he wants to be the be the goal scorer. But you know, to have a player like Robbo in with me is is brilliant. You know, the years that we spent on the pitch at Swansea and the partnership that we had together was was brilliant. You know, we created a a lot of a lot of my goals and he was brilliant for the way I played. And not only to have him out sit there on the pitch, but to have him in the dressing room is is great. Not only for myself but for the other lads as well, you know, to pass that knowledge knowledge on and to to see how he does things because even, you know, He's, he's getting on a bit himself like I am, but you know he's still 100% when he gets out there and you can still see that he's got that quality. Definitely. Thank you very much, Trends. We look forward to watching you again next season. Thanks, Ab. So there we have it. Two legends of Welsh football. One who has scored over 100 goals in Welsh divisions and the other who has just created history by guiding Connors Key Nomads to their first Cymru Premier title.